Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are giving folks a few extra minutes to get logged on here. But uh, as you are, um, as we're waiting, if you wanna test out the chat box and tell us what part of the state you are joining us from today, make sure you select that it will go to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see uh, where everybody's from. So um, you are all muted and all of your cameras are off. So the chat box is the way that uh, you'll be able to participate today in the webinar. So um, go ahead and test it out. Tell us where you're from and we'll get started in just a few moments. And hey, this is Jay Kick, and I'll be talking about snakes today. Um, if y'all don't mind adding uh, maybe a favorite snake or two to your comments, I'd, I just kind of like to get an idea of, of what y'all like out there. Um, and maybe even uh, if you want to comment about, you know, whether you join this, this webinar because you like snakes or you don't like snakes, um, I'd like to know that. <laughs> uh, and just want to maybe become more comfortable with snakes. Um, so yeah, any, any, anything like that, I'd, I'd love to hear about. So yeah, what are your favorite snakes and have you se seen any this year? Welcome everybody. We uh, still have a lot of folks joining us, so uh, we are gonna wait for a few more minutes, but uh, please uh, feel free to test out the chat box. Uh, we let us know what part of the state you are coming from or joining us from today. And uh, we also want to hear what your favorite snakes are, what kind of snakes you've been seeing lately. Um, and if you like snakes or not, just, just let us know uh, so we can uh, kind of address some of that as, as Jay goes through the presentation here. But um, we will get started in just a few minutes. All, all of the participants are muted and your cameras are off. So the chat box is really the way uh, to partic participate in today's webinar. So 
um, test it out, make sure it's set to go to all panelists and attendees and uh, tell us what part of the state you're from and uh, what snakes you've been seeing lately and, and your favorite snakes. Well, we, we, have a, we have a Wendy from New Jersey that's moving to South Carolina, but she doesn't like snakes. So after this uh, webinar, she might not be moving to South Carolina. But uh, no, I, uh, I think we have around I think we have around 38 snakes here in South Carolina. Now, I was looking at other states recently. Um, I can't remember which one, but they only had like 16 or 17 species. So, um, you know, our, our diversity in snakes is, is pretty re remarkable. You know, some people say we, we have right at 30. I've heard over 40, but this is coming from DNR's website, Department of Natural Resources. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> I'm going to stick with the, the upper 30s, 38 ish. Um, and we'll, we're just going to kind of scratch the surface today. Um, but yeah, we have people from the upper state. We've got people from the lower state. Hello from Mount Pleasant, a Sondra out there. Um, and you know, y'all have a, a form of, of rat snake, the Eastern rat snake, and it's it's kind of yellowish with cool lines on it, which uh, we don't we don't have here in the in the Midlands or the or the upper state. So I, I haven't seen that one in, in person yet, but I, I will at some point. Um, Call Call Interpretive Center down there in Charleston is is a wonderful place to to do some snaking in the, uh, the Francis Marion forest down there as well. Rebecca, I agree, corn snakes are really neat looking. Um, and that's a species that I haven't seen in the, in the wild. You know, a lot of them uh, get, get killed because people think they're copperheads, which is one of the reasons I wanted to, I wanted, we wanted to do this class. Um, you know, not to mention habitat loss that, that kind of affects their populations too. Yeah, and I agree with you. So many people think that they're venomous, and, and I'll kind of talk about that um, as we go through the presentation. Um, always reminds me of my my neighbor growing up on Lake Murray. He he said he would he would kill five, six, seven uh, water moccasins or cotton mouse each year, and um, you know we don't we don't have uh, water moccasins on Lake Murray, so um, he was killing water snakes, and and all he had to do was uh, just learn a couple little easy ID tricks, and and he would have probably let those uh, let those snakes live. Yeah, and a DK or brown snake, they're, they're the same thing. Um, I guess a Mr. or Mrs. DK found it one day and got to name it. Um, my last name is Keck, so hopefully at some point y'all will either see a Keck snake one day if I, if I find one or a Keck bird. <laughs> um, but yeah, small, small snakes, um, you know, I'm not going to talk about them. Um, I, I don't have any pictures of those today, um, but I'll talk about resources um, that you can use to, to learn more about those. But that is a, that is a, a common snake that, that we see, um, especially here in the Midlands. All right, I think it, we've got 1201 here and we do have some folks still joining us, but let's go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to have you all and ready to talk about snakes with everyone. I'm Sarah Green. I'm the executive director here at the South Carolina Wildlife Federation and it's great to see all of you. Um, I'll be helping today with the behind the scenes logistics while Jay's telling you about snakes. So uh, as I mentioned, you are all muted and your cameras are off, so you don't have to worry about fixing your hair and that kind of thing. Uh, but use, you can use the chat box for questions and comments, stories, all that kind of stuff. Uh, make sure that it's set to go to all panelists and attendees, and that way your fellow attendees can see your questions and your comments as well as, as Jay and I seeing it. So um, I'll, I'll monitor the chat box and keep track of the questions there. And then every once in a while, I'll pop on and interrupt Jay and um, we'll give him some of your questions. And then we'll also save some time at the end for any questions that we didn't get addressed during the presentation. So this webinar is being recorded and we will follow up after the webinar with an email. And so we'll send you the recording. We always also post them on our YouTube channel. So you can go back at any time and watch it again. You can share it with your friends and you can also watch our other previous webinars 
uh, on lots of other different topics. So uh, be sure to check that out as well. But we'll send you the recording link um, and lots of other information after the webinar is over. So um, at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Day. I think you should be able to share your screen now. There we go. I can see it. All right. And so I will introduce Jay. Jay Keck is our Habitat Education Manager here on our staff. And uh, with that, Jay, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks All right. a lot, there. Um, yeah. So and and I'm uh, I'm the I guess the the staff bird person too. And a and a bird changed my life, you know, ten or eleven years ago. But it's <clears throat> but it's it's also connected me to to other wildlife. Um, you know, I'm, I'm first and foremost a bird guy. Um, but it's connected me to to so much um, other stuff that's out there. Um, and and snakes are are one of the the creatures that I like the most. Um, and, uh, you know, since I started this job, it just seems um, I, I found out that so many people are just absolutely terrified of snakes and they uh, they kill them um, out, of, out of fear. And uh, from from what I've 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 seen, it, it's really not that hard to learn, you know, which snake is which. And there's some great, great resources out there. Um, and they're a part of the, 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 the ecosystem, y'all, you know, I'm, again, I'm a bird person. And so you think of a lot of these snakes and you'll see how small these, these babies and juveniles are, they are bird food. Um, if you watch a, a great blue heron on, on Lake Murray or down there at the coast or, you know, a, a lake or a pond in the upper state, um, great blue herons, you know, uh, love eating snakes. Um, you know, other birds eat them. Um, you know, uh, opossums, uh, raccoons, bobcats, skunk. Um, I mean, they, they're, they're eaten, you know, by, by many, many animals out there. So they're an, an important food source for, for wildlife. So, you know, we, we need to make sure they're, they're around. Think of all the protein and the fat and the nutrition that they offer, you know, everything else that's out there. So, um, yeah, let me let me just play this video real fast. It's kind of a funny one. You're going to have to bear with me and my family because we talk in this one. But you just just check out the excitement over a uh, copperhead that we saw for the first time last year here near our house. Hey, that was right on our road. Hey, Daddy, I'll yeah. Pretty good size one, not real big, but yeah. yeah. Decent size. Okay. Hi guys. If you get new, I get the same Why? You mean with your hand? No. Why? That's how people get bit. <laughs> All right, so that was my five-year-old telling my father-in-law, who's you know in his sixties, not to touch a copperhead. And I will say the same thing to <clears throat> to everyone out there. You know, if you don't, not just a copperhead, but if you're not sure what it is, do not touch it. If you are absolutely 100% positive and you're okay with with handling snakes, you know that's that's fine. But um, you know, if it's a venomous species, um, I recommend not not touching it. Um, you know, un unless you're an expert. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we were so excited. We, we've lived in Chapin now for six years. We built this house out here and we found eight snake species on our property. We have three acres and we haven't um, had a copperhead though. Uh, this one was just found about a hundred yards away on the, on the dirt road. It just crossed up there. But you know, my wife's in the background singing a, a song about a copperhead. She's a pharmaceutical sales rep. She's cute. She's small and uh, she likes Pittsburgh Steelers football, but she also likes snakes. Um, and, uh, you know, the kids were, were just absolutely thrilled to see it. Um, my father-in-law, again, he's a small Italian, so he needs to, uh, he, he thinks he needs to do some tough things sometimes. And, uh, I, I just wouldn't let him touch it, which, uh, again, is, is what I would recommend to, to everybody else. But, um, you know, what I've seen, uh, before COVID, we were getting into schools, uh, a snake expert, Brandon Ergel, um, a lot of the photographs from this presentation come from him. That's him right there with the with the uh, students. Uh, the, the kids, I, I want to say if we saw 100 kids, which we did this day, I, I bet only five of them didn't want to touch the snakes um, and weren't excited, you know, that, that we brought snakes to the class. So think about 
you know, 90, 95 kids out of 100 getting really, really excited to, to see snakes, to hear about snakes, to touch snakes. Um, you know, then compare that to, we, we also went up, the Brandon and I went up to Michelin, um, a, uh, a, one of their branches um, here in South Carolina, and probably talked to 100 adults. And out of the 100 adults, I bet, you know, 10 or 15 wanted to even get remotely close to the snakes, and none of them wanted to touch it, or, or hardly anybody did. You know, so it makes me think, you know, where does that fear come from or um, that disinterest, you know, of, of snakes between, you know, third grade to, you know, mid 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, but people were people were really terrified, um, you know, of the snakes. And, and we had to keep them in the, uh, the plastic containers that we we brought them in when we went to uh, went to Michelin. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of a, a, a interesting thought to have. Um, again, where, where does that uh, excitement kind of fizzle out and it, it turns to fear? Where does that come from? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I'm hoping it's going to change though, because uh, nature needs it. Um, so I just want a quick picture of, of where the fall line is in South Carolina, where the Piedmont meets the coastal plain, because uh, a lot of these uh, snakes that we're going to talk about only live in the coastal plain, and then some of them just live around the around the Piedmont. So I just kind of wanted to, to give you all a, a visual of that, um, just so you can you can think about that whenever we're talking about some snakes. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, I think uh, there was somebody from Mount Pleasant that that like rat snakes. They're they're fantastic snakes, um, and we have a we have a couple here in South Carolina. We have the eastern rat snake. And if you're in the Piedmont area or if you're in the upper state, um, it's going to it's going to have a blackish color to it. Um, and somebody had mentioned seeing black snakes, I think, on the river walk here in Columbia. Um, and it could be a couple different different uh, types of snakes. Right. So a black it could be a, a eastern rat snake, a uh, black rat snake. Um, they can also look really gray as well and nice and pattern. This is almost kind of in between a, a black rat snake and a gray rat snake. But again, it, it's still an eastern rat snake. Um, and then you jump over this corn snake right here and you go to the yellow rat snake and that's also an eastern rat snake, but that's going to be the one that's found down by the coast. So visually different, but they are the same species. So, you know, here in the Piedmont, um, and I, I like to use the word probably uh, a lot, but we're probably not going to see this snake you know, around uh, where we are or in the upper state. Um, we're going to see these gray uh, rat snakes, um, just barely, but we're mostly going to see the black rat snakes. But again, they're all the eastern rat snake. Um, and then you have a corn snake, um, and they are a rat snake. Um, and, uh, you know, the, people call them the red rat snake. Uh, really, really beautiful. You can't really misidentify that um, as long as you know it's a rat snake with, with any other rat snake that we have here. Um, Gorgeous snakes, uh, you know, they, they, they eat rodents, they eat small mammals. Um, you know, this, this Eastern rat snake loves to climb. And let me just kind of show you a picture of its, its ventral area. So the dorsum's on the back and the, the ventrum's right here. Um, so you can see how flat it is. This is just kind of something that I, that I created on the PowerPoint. So it might not be 100% accurate, you know, so. Uh, but, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea. You can see how flat that is. So when we're talking about brick, brick uh, homes, um, poles, trees, uh, you know, these, these are really great uh, climbers and they, they just have that flat uh, ventral area that, that helps them. And, and the edges right here, you can see the edges and sometimes they'll even, I've seen them kind of, it looks like they're, it's overlapping, you know, it's, it's body and, and it really, uh, enables them to, to grip onto things nicely. So eastern rat snake right here, that's, that's the, the black or the gray, but I would consider that black. Um, you know, a lot of white right here on the, on the jaw, the lower jaw, and the, a little bit on the upper, and, you know, kind of whitish throughout. Um, you know, when we talk about a black racer and, and a lot of other snakes, they're, they're more roundish, right? Um, and it, and it uh, kind of impedes how, how well they can climb um, or crawl or, or slither across smooth surfaces. If, you, if you've ever seen a uh, rough green snake cross a road, a lot of times it, it has a lot of trouble just because it's, it, it, it's just not, the, the shape of it isn't conducive to, to kind of gripping on to that, that pavement like the um, eastern rat snake here. You see one of those cross the road, it has no problem at all, but that's because it's, it, it's, it's shaped like this. It can really latch onto that road. Yes, ma'am. 
Got a couple questions about rat snakes. Um, do they also eat venomous snakes? Um, I don't think they do. Um, we'll, we'll get into the ones that will, but as far as I know, um, you know, they, they stick to rodents. You know, the Eastern rat snake is a great, um, you know, bird eater. Uh, you know, if you don't want your birds to, to become, you know, prey for a, for a rat snake, you know, put a predator guard on your um, pole and try not to put your bird feeders or not bird feeders. Um, well, I guess those two, but uh, bird boxes on trees because, you know, it's, it's no problem. But, you know, it happens in nature. So if, if you have enough land for that, you know, so be it. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as I know, they don't um, eat venomous species. Okay. Are rat snakes endangered? Uh, no, they're common. Yep. They're okay. common species. Yeah, luckily. But again, okay. you know, every everything, it, it, it seems like so so much wildlife is on, uh, is, is in decline. So if there's anything on your property that you can do, uh, again, I teach bird classes. A lot of time I, I talk about creating brush piles, even for birds, and everybody starts getting that sour look on their face. And I know exactly what they're thinking. And I ask them, I say, how many of you are thinking about snakes right now? And they all raise their hand. And, uh, you know, uh, they're just like, I'm not going to build a, a, a brush pile because of because of snakes but you know snakes again are food um and you can you can uh in, enhance your property for snakes too um and it right. and it's enriched our lives and there's and we'll see how gorgeous snakes can be and you can find these on your own property are they ever aggressive towards people uh uh, just snakes in general or rat snakes um i mean rat snakes can't you, you know, well listen rat snakes I, I even even a little kid, you know, my, my five year old is 62 pounds, I think, and he uh, is, you know, just just so much bigger than this, you know, probably three pound rat snake. So if I'm getting cornered and I'm three pounds and something else is 62 pounds, I'm going to defend myself. It has a mouth. It can bite. Um, say that about anything. Um, so they're not aggressive, but if you corner one or you try to catch one, it will defend itself just like you or I would if we're, if we're cornered in any situation or in certain right. situations. Right. Um, so, you know, if you have a snake and um, it's not bothering you, don't bother it. And um, I would just say, enjoy it. But um, so, so what rat snakes will do, or the, the Eastern rat snake right here, it'll kind of kink its body. I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, but just, you can just Google Eastern rat snake kink, um, I guess, um, and, and plenty of pictures will come up um, and they'll kink their body, um, maybe to make them look more intimidating. I've read that it, that it, it kind of gets them ready to, to bolt, but they'll, they'll, a lot of times the Eastern king snake, the, uh, the Eastern rat snakes will kind of hold their ground. They'll freeze. And if you come up to them, you know, a lot of times the uh, Eastern rat snake will, will kind of coil up and will strike. Um, you, you know, I, I was trying to help one cross the road and uh, it, 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 coiled up at me and try to strike me. And I was like, wait, <laughs> I'm trying to help you. Um, but they don't know that. Uh, so they'll, they'll defend themselves if, if they have to. Um, but if they get, if they, if you are bitten by a, by a rat snake or, you know, any of the other non-venomous ones, um, you know, unless you have, you know, some kind of allergy to its sal saliva, um, you know, or, or you, there's, there's some dirt around its mouth that, or, or bacteria, um, you, there's nothing really worry about. Just wash it with soap and water and, and you, you should be fine. All right, thanks. That's all the questions for now. Okay. All right, great. Um, the other the other black snake or one of the other black snakes that we have here in, in South Carolina, um, and they're and they're all over South Carolina are are black racers. Um, and you know they're they're a little bit more cylindrical than the than the uh, eastern rat snake um, and, and a lot more slender. Um, their, their, their head just kind of goes nicely into their body. Uh, their eyes are huge um, and they're they're forward facing. The juveniles look really funny and we'll look at a picture of them you know here in just a little bit but they eat all sorts of things and uh after a talk one day about snakes somebody sent me this picture um from little mountain uh here above chapin and and he had a a black racer that was eating a venomous um copperhead right there and we'll talk about our, our awesome copperheads in a little bit um but you know black racers eat Eat, eat things when they're alive. Um, so they don't rely on uh, constriction. Um, so, so think about that. Think about that battle, what it must have uh, taken to, to subdue that, that or um, yeah, copperhead. 
um, and then consume it. So black racers are great. They, they eat other snakes, of course, uh, rodents, amphibians, birds, um, you know, even insects, you know, one of the favorite snacks of a copperhead or, or cicadas, um, especially whenever they're young. Um, so think about all the, the bug control, you know, that these uh, snakes are doing, especially the ones that eat rodents. Um, I think our number two tick controller here in South Carolina is the timber rattlesnake based on um, all the, all the, you know, uh, mammals that it, that it eats. The, the number one tick consumer is a, is an opossum. Um, but these guys are very, very fast. Um, you, you know, we were, we were sitting at the uh, kitchenette over here one day eating dinner. And uh, my, my son, he said, there's a snake out there looking at us. And uh, we can see into the backyard and there was a, there was a black racer. They'll, they'll kind of call what, or do what's called periscoping. They'll kind of raise up their diurnal, right? They, they like to hunt in the day uh, and they'll raise up and just kind of look around. And so this snake hit the snake's head or, or his neck to, or mid mid body to it to its head was was just kind of poking up, and it probably wasn't looking at us, but it, it kind of looked like it. And so uh, what they'll do is flee. So I went out. I was all excited. I wanted to catch it to show the kids, but you know, as soon as I opened the door, it just bolted into our prairie area and just disappeared. Um, you know, remember the eastern rat snakes. A lot of time, the eastern king snakes will kind of hold their ground. They'll, they'll just kind of freeze. These guys typically just bolt. Uh, they're very fast, um, and you, you just and, and they'll they'll just disappear under some kind of brush or other cover. Um, up to five feet long, you know. You think about the eastern rat snake. This one, this one here, and this one. Um, they can get up to six, seven. I've heard, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know if they're confirmed or unconfirmed um, reports of them even getting to around eight feet. So, you know, six footer would be big, uh, seven footer would be huge. Um, you think about that. I'm six four, and to think about a snake that's, you know, a, a good bit taller or longer than I am is is pretty cool to think about. Um, let's see. On staying on black snakes here. Um, the Eastern King Snake. Now that one is one that's resistant to the venom of our pit vipers. Okay, so copperheads and cottonmouths um, and then the rattlesnake species that we have here. And it eats all three of those species. Uh, so great, great snakes to have on your property. Um, they, they keep the venomous species down. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, you know, when I, when I give talks and I bring up snakes, people show me pictures of dead snakes all the time that have been killed. And, and this one is killed often because it has some markings on it and people think it's a copperhead, um, which is typically the case. People are always saying, hey, we killed a copperhead and it ends up being a eastern rat snake or a corn snake or, or this guy here. Um, so great snakes to have, and uh, as you can see, they're, they're, they don't look anything like a copperhead. You just have to take a, a, a teeny weensy amount of time just to see the differences. Um, the young look, look like the adult. You can see this one. We found this one in our yard. I'm just holding that in our hand. Cute little, cute little Eastern King snake. Um, but they'll also eat lizards and amphibians, birds, rodents. Um, they eat eggs too. Um, and they do constrict. Uh, they're very, very strong, strong snakes. And they, uh, you know, a big one, we, you know, probably three and a half, four, four feet long. Um, so they don't, they don't get as long as a, um, as a Eastern rat snake, but they do get quite, they can get quite thick. Beautiful snakes though. Yes, ma'am. Got a couple more questions for you. Um, this question says, will snakes sometimes scavenge for food? Well, I've seen a I've seen a water snake eat or, or try to go after a dead catfish. It was probably a brown water snake. Brown water snakes, uh, for whatever reason, they they really like catfish. And you think about that dorsal spine that catfish have, or they have spines on their the the lateral fins too. I don't know how they digest that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, just based on that, it's kind of anecdotal, but, um, I would, I would say that they do, but, you know, most of the snakes that we're talking about today, you know, a lot of the smaller ones, you know, eat, eat slugs, eat, eat worms, eat a lot of insects. A lot of them eat, eat, eat each other, you know, the, the bigger ones eat the smaller ones. Um, so invertebrates, vertebrates, but they're mainly hunting them. You think about, you know, the, the beautiful camouflage that most of these, a lot of these snakes have, especially the, the pit vipers. I mean, they are ambush hunting, you know, live, live prey. So they're not, they're not scavenging. Um, it's a great question. I'm, I'm more of a bird guy, so I don't know the, the those kind of 
uh, I, I guess a little bit deeper questions, but mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an interesting one to, to ask. And I, I have, again, seen a, a water snake, you know, um, kind of scavenge a, a, a fish before. That's great. Um, we had a question of what is the biggest snake? And I know we have, there's a lot bigger ones in other parts of the world, but sure. what's the biggest one in South Carolina? Well, it's it's either got to be the the eastern rat or the um, eastern diamondback uh, rattlesnake, um, and and we'll talk about that one in a little bit. But I'm pretty sure there are confirmed reports, maybe not in our state, um, but of of eastern diamondbacks getting to eight feet. So. Um, you know, right, right there um, in, in length, you know, it's going to be probably between the Eastern Diamondback or the Eastern Rat. Now the Eastern Diamondback is probably the, the heaviest, you know, they can get up to 10 pounds, which you think, think about that for a snake. Um, that's, that's, that's pretty beefy. Yeah, absolutely. So do any of these uh, that we have in South Carolina live in holes in the ground or are they just hunting when they're in holes in the ground? Oh, no, 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 they, they uh, you know, hypernaculums or, uh, you know, places for them to, to seek shelter, uh, holes are fantastic. Um, you know, these, the Eastern King Snake is, uh, it's underground a lot. Um, so they, they love, you know, hunting in holes, they'll seek shelter in holes. You, you look at how, look at this head right here. It is, it can disappear under leaf litter in, in a heartbeat. You know, I've seen a two and a half foot, uh, you know, King Snake just, just disappear. Um, in just a couple seconds. And they, they are made for going, you know, underground. They're made for going under leaf litter. You know, look how streamlined that is. They have smooth, smooth scales as opposed to the keeled scales. You know, they have ridges on them of the, of the Eastern rat snake. Um, so these guys love to go underground. Um, the scarlet snake that we will talk about in a little bit, the scarlet king snake that we'll talk about in a little bit, the coral snake, you know, those are, a lot of them are fossorial, which just means they spend a lot of time underground. So um, not, not, just to, not just to hunt. Um, you know, I, somebody was talking about a brown snake earlier when I was uh, getting my garden ready last year. I remember, you know, digging probably 10 inches, you know, below the soil surface to plant something and, and there was a, you know, brown snake sitting there. So, you know, wow. they're, they are underground a lot. Um, and somebody asked me the other day, they were on my property and he said, how many, how many snakes do you think were, are on your property? Um, and I think the, there was a study about, sorry, I was going to try to find one snake, uh, about the ring neck, and they estimate anywhere from uh, 400 to like 1,200, I think, per hectare, which is, I think, 2.47 acres. Um, so, but they're tiny. Um, so I told him, I gave him a low estimate of three or 400, but I'm sure I've got way more than that, because you think about a snake, you know, just being, being a few inches long and having three acres, think about how many snakes can fit on there. Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple other questions in the chat box. I'm keeping a list here, but I'll let you keep going. Um, some of these I think you might get to, um, okay. and otherwise we'll hold them for the end. Okay. All right. Later. All right, so let's talk about the juveniles. You know, just like in, in young birds and other animals, the, the young ones can be quite tricky to identify. Um, so you, you think about the Eastern rat snake right here as a, as a juvenile, you know, it looks totally different. And so many of these get killed because they think they're copperheads. Uh, this one in particular, the corn snake, because it does have that brownish, you know, color to it. Um, you know, a friend of mine down in Charleston sent me a picture of it and I said, is it dead? And he said, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it just, it happens all the time. Um, but, you know, the, the eastern rat snake, the, the way you kind of tell the difference between this and the, the black racer right here and the corn snake, it, it has this cool little Y shape right here. And Brandon Ergel taught me about that, um, our snake expert. Um, and I thought that was really cool. Um, and then you see the corn snake and it has this uh, arrow and it even keeps that as, a, as an adult. So, you know, a, a lot of times you'll see an adult, um, a picture of one, or, or maybe you're out and about and you, you're lucky enough to see one and you'll see this, this arrow. Um, you know, there's variation. Sometimes it can be kind of broken, but for the most part, you know, it, it looks like that, which um, is pretty diagnostic. Um, and then you, you can see obvious, you know, the, the reddish kind of orange orangish color and and it does have um the uh the, the the pattern of a rat snake right you see this pattern which is way different from this this black eraser pattern uh, it's very spotted um it has the jagged lines um you know this is this is a lot 
uh, I guess more more pattern in terms of just just large chunks um, of coloration on the corn snake and then the the black rat snake or the eastern rat snake. But look at these eyes. Look at these goofy eyes that this black racer uh, has. So you know the eye is almost as as wide. You know when you talk about up and down as the actual head. Um, you know kind of forward facing. You know uh, or forward positioned on the on the face. Uh, or the head of that of that species, and look how slender it is. Um, just a lot uh, more slender of a of a species. Um, and and again, the the blotching or the the spotting just isn't as as large uh, as, as on as is on these um, rat snakes here. So really neat snakes, and and you know pretty pretty soon we'll we'll start seeing you know some of the the young ones, and then again you know probably in the fall time is another good time to to find snakes in in general. And that's that's bird food again. Remember that, okay? So when you take one of these these out, um, you're you're taking bird food out. You're taking um, food away from from all sorts of mammals and and other uh, bullfrogs. I mean, think about <laughs> frogs will eat snakes. Uh, you know, the larger species. Um, so you know, two two snakes that I didn't know existed um, until I got into birds, which made me kind of into everything. Um, the the scarlet snake and the scarlet king snake. Um, and we have those here in South Carolina. You know, you, you coastal planters, you know, get all the cool snakes, but this the, scar, the scarlet king snake is, is more of a coastal plain species. You know, again, here in the Piedmont where, where I am or the lower part of the Piedmont, we, we probably won't, won't get too many of those, um, but they like those pine forests, the sand hill uh, habitat. Remember, they like to kind of, um, you know, go, go underground so that, so that nice loose sandy soil is, is, is what they like. Um, and they don't get too big. You, you think about, you know, 14, 20 inches down here. Um, you know, this is a, might be an adult uh, here that's that somebody's holding in their hand. Um, this one, you know, definitely is. Uh, but you you want to tell the difference between the scarlet snake and the scarlet king snake. The, the scarlet king snake has complete bands. So, you know, they go all the way around the body. Okay, all the way around the body. Whereas the scarlet snake has more of these saddles. You see the, the saddle kind of um, fits right there over the dorsum, goes kind of in the, the ventral area, the, the belly there, but they're not complete. They're not complete. They're not complete. And here's another great picture. They're saddles. They're not complete rings like the scarlet king snake has. Um, and you can see the color variation too. This one's kind of, you know, kind of uh, whitish and that one has kind of like creamy yellowish um, bands. Uh, but the red touches the black. The red doesn't touch the yellow, okay? Um, and same over here, the red touches the black. So that tells us, at least in our state, uh, unless there's just some dropped off, you know, venomous species that's different. In our state, when red touches black, um, it's, it's a non-venomous species, as long as it's a native species to South Carolina. Uh, the coastal plains have uh, the scarlet snakes. Um, and so does the Piedmont. You know, my, our nanny, um, uh, she sent me a couple pictures of uh, scarlet snakes that her mom has caught. Um, we had a board member, you know, in downtown Columbia, I think the Forest Acres area, that sent a picture of a scarlet um, snake. So, you know, they're, they're around here, but so far, uh, nobody sent me one of a scarlet king snake. Those are more of a, a coastal uh, plain species, but both of them are small and both of them are, are absolutely uh, beautiful. So if you're ever flipping, you know, uh, uh, 10 or sheets of aluminum or 10, you know, somewhere out, out in the woods or in the field, you know, there's a good chance of finding a snake. Okay. It could be a venomous one. So you got to be careful, but there's a good chance of finding, you know, uh, one of these guys. Um, you, you look in logs or, or under logs, under bark, you know, it's another good area to, uh, to find this, this beautiful species, but just make sure you put everything back as closely as you can, at least to, to the way you found it. Um, so as not to disturb, you know, that habitat that's out there. So we'll look at the, the Scarlet King over here. Remember, com complete circles. The Scarlet Snake uh, has the saddles and then the Coral Snake, which has the complete circles again. You can see that the Coral Snake, which is a, a venomous species here in South Carolina, um, usually underground, hardly even the, the people that are really hardcore snake people um, don't find this species just because it's really hard to find. Um, they're underground uh, a lot. Uh, even though they get kind of big, like look at that, 48 inches in, in some cases. 
Um, but they have this black black nose, this black snout. You see the scarlet king snake does not. You see the, the scarlet snake does not either. And then again, you can see that the red touches the yellow. So the red touch yellow, kill a fellow, right? Red touch black, what is it? Friend, friend of Jack or venom lack is the, is the rhyme. Um, if you can't, if you have to rely on that rhyme and you see a tri-colored snake, just, uh, just don't touch it, please. Um, but uh, yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous species and uh, ones that we should, should be proud that, you know, we, we have right here in South Carolina. Um, so these are kind of lookalikes, right? Uh, we have a nice Eastern ribbon snake, uh, you know, in the mountains, it, they're, they're supposed to be throughout the entire state, but as you get closer to the coast, they become more abundant. Um, you know, the only place that, that I've seen them really are, are around the coast, uh, but we're supposed to have them here in the, in the Piedmont and, and I guess in the, in the mountains as well. Um, but uh, the ones that we do find kind of everywhere are the, the Eastern garter snakes. Um, and that's a really, a lot of people call them garden snakes, but I, I think that's just uh, kind of mis, misnamed, they misheard, but it's the Eastern garter snake. Um, and they, you know, get, get a decent size over, over two feet, same with the, uh, the ribbon snake here. Um, but you can see here, you know, that, that this lacks the, the lines on the jaws that the garter snake has. You know, people have said this is also more, this little teardrop right here is also more pronounced on the ribbon snake than on the garter snake. Um, so just, just looking at their diet, um, you can kind of see where they like to uh, be or, or, or live, what their habitat is. So fish, tadpoles, worms, frogs, toads. So it kind of kind of lets you know they, they kind of like wet wet edges, wet areas. Um, you know, I'm uh, kind of in a highland, I guess, um, but I've had them here too. There's a couple um, vernal ponds, so, so uh, depressions in the ground that hold water um, a, a decent amount of the year, but you know, they don't have fish, but they do have amphibians, probably have salamanders. Um, plenty of toads around here, other, other snakes. Um, so, you know, there's, we, we've seen a, a garter snake, I think twice in a, in a couple of years. So not the most abundant snake that we have here, but, but they are, are here. Uh, never seen a ribbon snake here, but again, once you get closer to the coast, um, you'll, you'll see more and more of those. So with that, with that being said, you know, which, which snake is this? Uh, and y'all can use the chat box and I'm going to do this a couple of times, but is that a ribbon snake y'all, or is that a garter snake? And if y'all, if y'all would, I'm going to look at the chat box right now. I want y'all to, I want y'all to use it and tell me what snake that is, please. Or maybe Sarah, you could, you could see if, I don't know if I can see the chat box right now. Sure, we've got lots of votes for ribbon snake. Yes, all right, everybody was paying attention, good job. Hey, this is gonna get harder y'all, so, so maintain, you know, focus. <laughs> that was an easy one, uh, but good job. All right, so red-bellied snakes, really, really, really pretty, really tiny snakes, but really uh, pretty. You know, think about that again, four to, four to 10 inches, um, bird food, right? So red-bellied snake, um, a lot of variation. Um, you think about some being brown, you think about some being red, green, um, greenish, um, or blackish. And, and here are some great pictures. And all these pictures come from a few Instagram accounts and, and some friends that we have. Um, uh, and, and I'll share those names with you a little bit later. But look at this one, you know, kind of uniform brown. Uh, this one's just this gorgeous <laughs> charcoal with this uh, dorsal line right here. Uh, of, of kind of like rusty red. Um, and then you have this, this other one, we see this one, you know, kind of a lot. Um, you know, they have this diagnostic light spot on the nape, okay, right, right behind the head. So you can kind of see that here. Do y'all see that little light spot back here? Um, on this one, it's really clear. You can see that light spot down here. This one, it's not so clear, but I'm sure if you got up close, you know, you could, you could probably see that. But if you're unsure, you just flip the snake over. A lot of times it'll actually show you, you know, it's, it's red. Um, it'll, it'll flare out, um, you know, it's, it's lips sometimes. Uh, but you, if you're unsure, just look at this. You know, a lot of people would probably think this is a brown snake or a decays brown snake, um, which they usually have some spots, you know, along along the sides. Um, but if you flip a decays brown snake or a brown snake over, it's not going to have a red belly. Um, but they're all over the state. Um, you know, forested habitats. We have them here in in Chapin. Um, 
uh, and then around the uh, coastal plain, they're around small wetlands. Um, and they're always, okay, I don't use the word always too often when I'm talking about nature, but um, they're always going to have an orangish or reddish uh, eventual area, uh, so, the, so the belly. But beautiful, beautiful small snake. Um, you can find them under rocks, you can find them under um, logs. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of focus on the snakes that, that we have, you know, commonly in our, uh, in our, in our yards. All right. Another gorgeous one in, in tiny is a ringneck snake. And so I, I love this right here from uh, the Audubon Society Field Guide to Reptiles and Amphibians, just to show you how hard sometimes it, it is to identify um, uh, animals. So common throughout the state, neck ring may be interrupted, obscure, obscure, or occasionally absent. <laughs> so uh, you might see a ring neck uh, snake that doesn't have a ring, you know, around its around its head. So if you're ever, you know, uh, kind of confused or just don't know what a snake is, um, you know, you can send it to us. And if I don't know, I can send it to one of our one of our herp herp, herp experts, uh, you know, snake and amphibian experts. Um, but it's a great snake. Um, let's see the yellow and orange underside yeah uh, the band around its neck you know that's that's pretty darn clear you can see that gorgeous uh the southern ringnecks will have a pattern belly so you see that beautiful pattern um the northern ringnecks usually have an have an unmarked belly uh but uh just just another common snake that we have here that a lot of people don't know about because you know it they, they do spend a lot of time um you know under under things undercover All right, and I'll try to um, throw you all a bunch of curveballs with the questions I'm going to ask you in just a second. But um, so these are these are water snakes. You know, if you go to the 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 South, uh, Savannah River Ecology Lab, they have five water snakes listed here in in South Carolina and Georgia. The only one that I don't have um, that I'm not going to talk about today is the the Florida green water snake or the green water snake, um, just because it's not too too common. Um, but you know, we have gorgeous ones, the banded water snake, and it's got this great eye line that, that goes behind the eye down to the, down to the, the back of the jaw. Uh, no other, you know, water snake that we have here in South Carolina has that beautiful brown water snake. And we're going to talk about each of these here in just a second, a Midlands water snake. And then we have this gorgeous plain bellied water snake. And I talk about this picture all the time with, whenever I teach classes to kids, because I always want them to imagine a snake climbing down here, swimming, and then climbing up this rock and just like positioning itself. And it does that without hands or legs, which is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, so plain bellied water snake, uh, a lot of, a lot of people call them a red bellied water snake. Um, they're common in the lower Piedmont. Okay. Where I am here in Chapin. Um, it's probably one of the more common water snakes that we have here. Um, and the coastal plain. Okay, so once you get above uh, this area, you're, you're probably not going to find those. Um, and that's the only water snake that we have in South Carolina with a plain belly. All these other water snakes, you know, you can see this clearly, um, have some kind of pattern. So if you if you see a water snake that doesn't doesn't have any pattern whatsoever, it's a it's a plain bellied water snake, appropriately named, right? All right, so here's some ID tips um, on water snakes. Uh, banded water snake, you know, around four feet, they're all relatively uh, large. The brown water snake can get really, really big, um, maybe even four, five to, to six feet long. Um, and I'm, I have little areas that they're located in. So I've got the, the map again of, of where the fall line is, and that's right here. So you look at the uh, banded water snake, it's found below the fall line. Okay, so, so right here and then lower. Um, it has that, again, dark stripe behind the eye to the end of the jaw. So where the jaw ends right over here. No other water snake has that here in South Carolina. Um, another really uh, cool identification tool um, is, uh, or, or characteristic, are, are the bands. They have bands, even when they're young, they don't have the checkering that other water snakes can have, but they have bands, complete bands, all the way from, from behind their head down to the tail. So, you know, uh, Brandon, again, you know, our snake guy said they look like tornadoes and they really do, uh, don't they? Isn't that neat? Um, and then they'll, where the, where the dorsum meets the vent, okay, the ventral area, um, you know, kind of on the side, they can, not always, right? Uh, but they can have this this rel reddish coloration. Um, I think that's that's all I wanted to say about that one. Um, let's go to the uh, the northern water snake now. So the northern water snake 
can be from around the Greenville area up. Now, but there's, there's a couple subspecies, uh, and then there's a Midlands water snake, which is a northern water snake, um, but the Midlands water snake is from around the fall line, so right here to the Greenville area. So, you know, they're both northern, all right, and they're in the northern part of the state, but the Midlands goes from right here in the Midlands to around the Greenville area, and then the northern goes from around the Greenville area up. Um, and they have the tornado, tornadoes or the, uh, the, the bands or the stripes going from behind the head and then to about the middle section of their body. And then it kind of turns into checkering. Do you see that? Isn't that neat? And that's, that, that's pretty consistent for uh, a Midlands or, you know, a northern water snake. Um, and they're all going to have what, what's called these labial lines, um, the lines on their, their jaws, um, which, which water moccasins do not have. Uh, so, you know, even the brown water snake, even though this one is, is pretty dark, you can still see those lines. You can see the lines on this one, even though it's kind of far away, and you can definitely see the lines on this one. Um, rat snakes have it too, um, but, you know, the water snakes uh, definitely have it. Um, really pronounced uh, a fe feature that they have. Uh, and a brown water snake. So that's, that's located in the Midlands, okay, down to the coast again. Um, those are great tree climbers. So, you know, a lot of people in kayaks, canoes going down some of our rivers or around lakes, they'll say, oh my gosh, a water moccasin, you know, fell, fell into the boat or, you know, fell, fell from a tree. Most of the time, if it's on a limb overhanging a, you know, a piece of water, it's, it's going to be probably one of these guys or another water snake, but they're great climbers. Um, water moccasins are kind of heavy, um, you know, and they'll lay on like logs and, and heavier cover. Or, or just some heavier stuff, you know, uh, around the water. But um, will they climb uh, every now and then? Yeah, but uh, if, if you're seeing a snake on, you know, thin limbs uh, around the water, it's, it's usually gonna be a water snake, not a, not a water moccasin. Um, kind of a neat thing to, to use um, or something to keep, keep in mind when you're identifying this one, it has these, well, it's huge, but it has these squares and they never meet. That you have usually around two scales in between the, this pattern. So you have this one here and this one here, and you have about a two scale width in between. So they, they never meet, um, which is, which is kind of neat. Um, you know, all, all these, you know, kind of touch, they, they have bands, uh, but these just, just don't meet. Um, could there ever be a variation? Possibly, but um, you know, that's, that's just kind of a general, general rule there. Um, their heads <laughs> look kind of dumb. <laughs> um, and we, when we think about birds and other animals, you know, I, I try to think about, you know, things that kind of stand out um, whenever I watch them or look at them. Um, you know, birds can be cute. Um, some are cuter than others. Um, some look, look like they have had way too many cups of coffee. Um, this one just kind of looks dumb. Like it has a tiny head on a gigantic body. Um, and you know, that's, that's a way to remember, you know, what, what you have. And then you're like, huh, oh, okay. That one looks kind of silly. Uh, it doesn't have those, the, the, the checkered spots aren't meeting. So, you know, it might be a, might be a brown water snake. And then if you're in the upper state or in the mountains, you're probably gonna be like, ah, oh, no, it's, it's not because that's not its range. So you use all these, all this information to figure out, you know, what, what animal you're trying to identify. Um, so. I want y'all to guess, you know, think about, think about all these snakes here. All right. Think about what we just talked about and then think about this snake and it's a water snake. Uh, the juvenile of this species is, is right here. All right. And think about all the information and, and see if you can figure out which one, you know, this, this snake is. And I want y'all to use the chat box if, if you, if you don't mind. And let's see, we, you know, this one was taken, I'll give you a couple clues. This one was taken, you know, in the, in the Piedmont um, area, not too far from Columbia. Y'all use that chat box. Let me know what you think. Got a couple different answers here so far, Jay. Um, brown water snake, plain belly, Midlands water snake, plain belly, plain belly. 
Awesome. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? So the banded, you know, it, it looks like it's got this red and, and this is, you know, can be the red bellied water snake, <clears throat> um, you know, commonly known as the, the plain bellied water snake as well. Um, but you see, you see how, let's see, let's get, let's get a picture of this one. This is again, the Midlands and you see how, how far apart these bands are. Well, as a juvenile, you can see how close these are. And that's because at some point it'll kind of fuse together and become one color. Um, and you can see that on this snake, you know, it, it's very uniform, doesn't have any bands. Um, but on this snake, you can, you can kind of barely see, you know, see those where, where the bands used to be. So that's a juvenile plain bellied water snake, which doesn't look anything like the, the adult, but you could tell that it's a water snake. You know, a lot of people would, would probably kill the snake thinking that it was a copperhead or a water moxin, but you can easily see the stripes, the, the labial stripes on the jaw here, which immediately tells me that it's a water snake, um, you know, but it doesn't look anything like its adult form, right? Um, but, uh, you know, you can still see the labial bars here on the, on the, on the head, um, and then that nice uniform color right here. And then obviously it's got that reddish tint to it. Um, and instead of, you know, driving y'all crazy again with, with this one, I'll just kind of tell you about it. But, um, you know, this one is, let's see, the banded water snake. All right. Nice, nice chunky snake. <clears throat> All right. And this one again is from the fall line down. And you can see that reddish coloration where that the, the dorsum, again, the top meets the, the ventrum, the bottom. So you can see that beautiful uh, red coloration, but there's also one other um, clue that, that'll tell you that it's a uh, um, banded water snake. And that's, and that's that, that eye line that goes from the behind the eye to the lower part of the jaw, remember. And I know this one's kind of dark, so it's kind of tough to see. Um, but that is, you know, another, another way to identify that snake. Let me get that situated there. Um, so yeah, that's a banded, banded water snake. And we only have around 10 minutes here, but we only have a few more slides. So I did want to talk about water snakes and water moxin. So again, you see these stripes on the, on the water snake and look, I, you know, I, I, um, a, a friend of mine gave me this picture and didn't tell me which which snake this was, but look again. You have this uh, band going from the back of the eye down to the lower jaw, and then you have this reddish coloration where the, the back meets the belly. So I am pretty sure that that's a banded water snake right here. <clears throat> um, but then you look at this, this cot or I'm sorry, the cotton mouth, or the water moxin, um, doesn't have the, the labial bars that the, the water snakes have. Um, has a really chunky head, really boxy looking. I always say, I always, it always makes me think because my boys play with Legos all the time and build things that it looks like somebody built it with Legos. Real sharp edges, uh, looks mean. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great predator. Um, but uh, yeah, a few different ways to, to figure out, you know, that it's a water moxin and not a water snake or it's a water snake and not a water moxin. But this, the water moxins have this great eye line Okay, not to be confused with, with this one. This one doesn't go, you know, uh, around the eye. This one starts behind the eye. And remember, this one's always got the bars. This one does not. Um, so chunky head, really angular. Um, it, this, this gray eye line all the way to the eye, no labial bars. And so, you know, a lot of times the eye, now this one looks more, more round, okay? So you can't always use that. You know, my dad always said, hey, if it's got, you know, cat eyes, it's a venomous one. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I'd be careful with, with that one because again, this one has round, round pupil right now, um, whereas this one does not. So I, I wouldn't use that as an identifying you know, factor. It can help. It's part of identifying um, and is useful a lot of the times, but uh, that wouldn't be my, my uh, only factor in identifying a snake or, or telling whether or not it's, it's venomous or, or non-venomous. And it doesn't work in other parts of the world too. Um, so this is a water moccasin. This comes from one of our Instagrammers and this is a water mox, or I'm sorry, water snake, Midlands water snake coming from another one of our Instagrammers. So no labial bars. Um, this one, you know, easy to see. Uh, it's not as, as chunky or, or, or angular as the, uh, as the water moccasin. So there's, there's ways to, to determine, you know, if it's a, if it's a water moccasin or not. Um, and let me see where I'm at. Okay. So again, real chunky, blocky head. 
Uh, looks like it was built with Legos. Um, real chunky body. You know, they're, they're pretty heavy, heavy snakes, heavily built snakes. Um, the tail kind of tapers off quickly, whereas, uh, I mean, this one's, you know, can be, it's kind of hard to, to, to compare it when there's nothing else to compare it with. But, um, you know, a, a water snake could be even longer than that and a, a lot longer, skinnier uh, portion of the tail than this, than this chunky uh, water moccasin here. But in general, their tail, tails are a lot thicker um, and end uh, abruptly as, you know, uh, compared to a water snake that just kind of keeps on going and going. Um, and you notice that this, this coloration has these spots, um, you know, kind of uneven bands. Um, they can be really, really dark, almost black looking, uh, depending on where you find them in South Carolina, or they can be really light looking like this one here. So, you know, just, just kind of think what you, what you've, you've heard so far today um, and think about what this one could be or what this one is. Um, you kind of look at those bands, you know, does it look like those bands there? Because a lot of people would think, I mean, somebody sent this to me and asked me if it was a water moccasin or a water snake. Um, and they were very, very concerned because look how chunky this, this snake is. Really, really meaty snake. But even from this picture, you know, you can see these, these labial bars, these, these, these stripes on its, on its face. So, you know, immediately I knew, even though the pictures are, are kind of horrendous, you know, it's, an, it's, it's a water snake. Um, and look at this tail. Look how long that tail is, you know? I mean, it, it goes to about right there. Um, so really long tail, you know, if it was a water moccasin, probably would end about right here. Um, and so now we know it's a water snake, but what kind is it? And you see these bars, okay, you see these bars and they start turning into checkers about, you know, a little bit uh, more than, than halfway or a little bit less than halfway down. Um, so bars that turn into checkered uh, pattern is a northern water snake. Uh, so either a Midlands water snake or a northern water snake, depending on where this picture was taken and I can't remember. So remember if it's from the from the fall line to around the Greenville area, it, it's probably a Midlands. If it's from the Greenville area up, it's a, it's a northern water snake. So that's a water snake. Just think about how many of those get killed each year because uh, people think that they're, they're cotton mouths. And our, our beautiful, beautiful, beautiful copperheads. I, I just talked to a, a native plant guy yesterday um, and he's, we were talking about snakes and he said his favorite snake is the copperhead. Just, just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous snake. Um, and you can see the Hershey Kisses um, that are kind of lined up on the side of this snake. You know, that's from the side view and it's, 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 it's such a great way to identify that snake. Um, doesn't look anything like a corn snake, um, you know, although it, I mean, maybe you can, you can convince yourself that it's kind of reddish looking, um, you know, that head is coppery looking, um, but, you know, basically a, a brown and, and tan snake. Uh, nothing that I can think of here in South Carolina has those Hershey kisses, or at least as, as uh, clear as the ones on a, that are on a copperhead. And then from the from the top view, you can see these saddles. Okay, um, nice little bars that that lead to the Hershey kisses on the side. And I've actually never seen the 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 uh, ventral view of a copperhead before, so I thought I'd include this. And I thought that was a really neat uh, neat picture to include. So that's that's what they look like from below, or at least this one right here. So nice nice little pattern there. But gorgeous, um, and you, you see one of these in leaf litter. Um, I mean, they just camouflage so nicely. You wouldn't think this simple pattern would camouflage so nicely, but it, but it does. Uh, just really, really nice camouflage in, uh, in the, 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 the leaves that we have right here in South Carolina. And that's a baby copperhead. So the baby copperheads look like an adult copperhead. So you think about his hook right here. All right, look at that hook right there. And this is an adult, all right? So now look at the baby. Look how small that is. You see that? Isn't that, isn't that neat? Tiny, tiny, tiny snakes. Um, and they have this great, you know, yellow, greenish chartreuse color tail that they'll kind of wiggle in front of them. They'll remember they're ambush predators. So they'll just kind of have that in front of them, wiggle it like a little worm, something comes along and they and they nab it. Um, so tiny as as uh, babies, um, and remember they're they're food for a lot of things. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I have a um, Copperhead comment slash question. 
um, from Jean. She says, I've heard that copperheads can be found at the base of trees during cicada emergence, attempting to grab their favorite meal as they ascend to the trees. So do, do you know, I mean, that's an amazing um, little tidbit there. Uh, what do, what do you, uh, the copperheads normally eat? Yeah, so they'll eat cicadas. Um, you know, I, I think I mentioned that earlier, you know, that one of their favorite snacks uh, is a cicada. Um, and I, I remember, um, who's the, uh, he's, I, he might be a board member of ours. Um, he's the Clemson Extension agent. Um, he, he works over in the Sand Hills area. Uh, he, he said he loves to look at oak trees during cicada emergences um, uh, for copperheads. Um, you know, it, so, uh, you know, there must be some truth in that. I've, I've never experienced it, but uh, I've, I've heard it and read it in many, many, you know, um, locations. So I, I would imagine, you know, it's, it's, it's true. Um, but they'll, they'll eat, you know, they probably eat other snakes. Um, you know, think of all these uh, as eating uh, invertebrates and vertebrates. So they eat, um, I'm sure they'll eat salamanders. They probably eat a lot of toads, um, frogs. Uh, so small, small mammals. Um, so probably anything that they can get their mouth around is, is what I would say. <laughs> Okay, um, and we've had a couple questions uh, on this topic too. Uh, I've heard that a triangular head is a venomous snake and a rounder head is non-venomous. Is that true? All right, so be careful with that. Um, well, I guess I would say it's not true, um, but it's tricky. Uh, you know, this, this non-venomous um, water snake, uh, the, the plain-bellied water snake is looking more intimidating by flattening out its head. Um, and it, and, and so it kind of mimics a venomous snake. Uh, again, it, my dad taught me that too. So my dad taught me, hey, if it looks kind of like an arrow shape, um, it has, you know, wider jaws, it's venomous. If it has the slit as a pupil, it's venomous. Uh, not always the case. Um, so this one's going to flatten out its head um, to look like a venomous species. I don't know if it knows that, but that's what it does. Um, and this is the adult and it's doing the same thing. Now their head is going to be a lot thinner when they do that, okay, because they're widening it and so it's going to drop everything. Um, it, it's going to kind of pancake, whereas an actual venomous species, you know, one of our pit vipers, they're going to have that chunky blocky head. Um, it's already expanded, you know, naturally. Uh, they, they don't do it themselves. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the venomous ones are going to have that diamond shape, but they're going to be chunky, but non-venomous ones can have that diamond shape too if they're defending themselves. Um, not all of them do it, um, but they can. So yeah, I wouldn't use that as a uh, as an identifying tool, but just just know that non-venomous ones will create that diamond shape in order to defend themselves. And those are two great examples of it. All right, let's see. So tiny tiny copperhead. Um, I think we can call that tiny copperhead cute, can't we? Here, let's look at that. Look at that. That's kind of cute. Um, all right, so let's talk about our, our rattlesnakes. Um, and, and we were talking about the biggest, you know, uh, snakes that we have here in South Carolina. Uh, out of the, I think it's recognized that there's 32 different types of rattlesnake species. Uh, the Eastern Diamondback, we're lucky enough to have in this region, in our state, uh, the, the largest or largest rat rattlesnake. So hooray, uh, <laughs> we have a big one here. Um, so the record is, is eight feet. Um, you know, who knows if, if somebody back in the day has found one larger than that. If, if so, it, it wasn't recorded. But um, yeah, the, the, you know, five, four, six feet long, um, you know, that's, I, I don't want to say it's common because they aren't common anymore. Um, but they do get, get very, very large. And so you think about that, that the map of South Carolina, so they're going to be located um, below the fall line here. Uh, in South Carolina and, and more concentrated along the, the lower coastal plain, you know, uh, getting, getting a little bit closer to the, to the water, to the ocean there. Uh, Timberlight rattlesnakes can be everywhere. They can be in the mountains where they're a little bit darker. This one might be kind of a, a uh, well, it's got, that one looks like it's a, in the low country just because of the vegetation around it. Um, but the, the lighter ones a lot of time are, are located, you know, from the sand hills down to the coast in the coastal plain, and they get darker as you, you kind of get up in the state, you know, to the, to the upper state. 
Um, you know, that's that's our number two, as far as I, I can tell, or, or I've, I've read, our number two tick consumer right there is the timber rattlesnake. Um, so they keep that Lyme disease down. They keep uh, all the other nasty diseases that, that ticks carry down for us. Uh, the Eastern Diamondback, again, we talked about that one. Great, great snake. And you can see how well it camouflages. Um, and then we have a, a teeny uh, rattlesnake here. And that's, that's generally found in the coastal plain. If you go to the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory's website, it'll kind of cover the entire state, I think, other than the mountains on its distribution, but it's, it's, it's population in the Piedmont area is really spotty. Um, I don't know the last time somebody's actually found one around here, but you know, once you get to the, the, the coastal plain, yeah, especially around the coast, you know, you start, you start finding these uh, snakes in, uh, in like pine um, uh, habitat, like longleaf pine habitat, you know, sand, sandier areas. And this one, you know, it can be once once you get down to the to the lower state of the coastal plain. A lot of people call this the the cane break, but the cane break is is a timber rattlesnake. And so, you know, we're we're a little after uh, one right now, and so I'm going to wrap up. But check these guys out. If y'all aren't on Instagram, um, you know, it, it it can be annoying for for some some people, but it can really help you learn about nature if you follow the right accounts and. Uh, I think there were just a couple of pictures that I included on here. So almost all the pictures came from these, these fellas. Uh, they're all young. It, it kind of makes me happy to know that there's, there's good people like this that are educating the public um, that are just in love with nature. Uh, Parker Gibbons, you know, takes pictures of all sorts of things, um, including insects. Um, but, and, and I don't know if y'all can see this, but there's a nice little timber rattlesnake right here. And look at him, he's so happy. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, and then, uh, so this is uh, our, this is the, the fellow that we use a lot, um, Brandon Ergel. He's a fantastic guy. He actually lives in Chapin, where I am. And then Ryan Burris. Um, I don't know if he's actually graduated from the Citadel yet, but a, a, a great young man. And, and again, makes me excited to know that these, these fellows are out here. So almost all the uh, pictures came from these three. And here are their Instagram accounts right here. If y'all ever want to uh, look them up, I, I suggest it. You'll learn a lot. And um, most of the time, these guys are, are eager, eager and excited to answer questions, you know, from, from the public who's uh, trying to learn more about snakes. And it's not just about snakes, right? Brandon has this huge snapping turtle with him. Um, so uh, turtles, you know, uh, reptiles, you know, amphibians, all, all sorts of things. Uh, great resources. Uh, these books are fantastic. Um, uh, this is probably one of the, the, the best ones that we have here in the Southeast, uh, written by one of the, the Southeast, I guess, most well-known uh, uh, snakers, herpers, uh, Whit Gibbons. Um, the Peterson Field Guide uh, to Reptiles and Amphibians is fantastic. And this book is really neat, too. It'll, it'll kind of dispel those, those myths, you know, um, that, that your, my dad told me, you know, that my mom told me about snakes. Um, and then finally... I just want to say thanks. You know, this is a this is a snake class, and we had a really good amount of people coming here, um, or, or that that attended, and uh, it's 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 really encouraging, and I appreciate y'all. But think about um, think about this. Uh, you know, think about just people uh, getting to know nature uh, on a deeper scale. You you look at this beautiful banded water snake that everybody just ID'd because we just took this class together. Um, you see the reddish right here and these bands that go all the way down, even though it's a dark one. Um, and then you know it's a water snake because of these bars here. But look, it's got the uh, little plastic ring that's below the cap on a water bottle or a Pepsi bottle, right? And so uh, it, it affects wildlife. You have this anhinga, and the, the reason I included that bird is because people call it the snake bird. Um, it has this beautiful long neck. Um, and that's, you know, it looks like a snake a lot of times whenever the body is submerged underwater. But look, it's got the plastic netting around that. We don't know if that bird made it. Um, and then you have this blue heron, this great blue heron that loves to eat snakes, um, foraging in a, in a pond right here in the Midlands in, in Irmo. And look at all the trash around here. It's, it's one of the more embarrassing uh, uh, large ponds in, in the area, but it, but it holds a lot of birds during the during the migration season and can be fun to go to, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of embarrassing. So, you know, if 
we, we need people to fall in love with snakes. They'll, they'll notice things like this. Um, you know, all, all three of those guys that I showed you pictures of, I mean, litter drives them crazy. It drives me crazy. It should drive y'all crazy. We should all be embarrassed, not just in South Carolina, but in the entire state. So, um, you know, help us get the message out, help us educate people, help us, um, get, kids and, and adults to fall in love with nature. If you fall in love with it, you'll take care of it. You'll think twice um, and avoid throwing things out of your window whenever you're driving down. And look at this kid. He's so cute and he's connecting with nature. And that's, uh, that's my kid. So um, I, can, I can say that about this young man, but he's holding a rough green snake. And that was in our house, our, our yard last, uh, last spring. So, um, you know, you get, get, get kids to connect young and, and they'll have a lifetime of, of enjoyment and anywhere they go on the planet, they'll, they'll be entertained because wildlife is everywhere. So help us through, through donating, um, help us educate, conserve and, and advocate, um, explore our website. Just don't go to it and, and donate, which we, we do need, but, but, but search it and, and explore it and, and learn, learn some things. We've got a lot of great content out there and uh, just want to say thank you one more time. We, we can't do it without y'all. So thanks a lot. Yes, thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you, Jay, for this wonderful presentation. I've got some more questions uh, that have kind of come up throughout and I've been saving some. I think some of them you answered. Um, so folks, if I don't say your question that you had earlier, stick it back in the chat box and we can circle back to it. Uh, but but before we get to the questions, I just want to just echo Jay's uh, comments and thank everyone for joining us um, and learning more about snakes. And hopefully you are all uh, moved now to protect snakes and, and really all of our wildlife. And so um, I'd also like to ask you to visit our website. We'll send you a link as a follow-up. Um, and you can find more information about attracting wildlife to your backyard and native plants and all kinds of great things. And then, of course, there's a donate button in the top corner as well to help us be able to keep doing these webinars. And uh, hopefully once, once COVID is gone, we can get back to doing some of our litter pickups and other in-person kind of events. So, uh, Hope you will stay tuned. We've got other events coming up and that kind of thing. So uh, please uh, come back and visit with us uh, on our Zoom classes and, and other events uh, in the future. So, um, so Jay, uh, how long do snakes live in general? And I think there was a question specifically about king snakes too. I don't know exactly how long they they live. You want if you want to learn more about um, you know that go to the South Savannah River Ecology Laboratory's website. Um, they they might not even specify there, but um, you know if if you want to email me that question, I can I can find the answer for you. And my email is just j at scwf.org. J A Y at S C W F dot O R G. But you know, some of the snakes that I, you know, I've, I've learned about, um, some don't reach ma uh, sexual maturity until, you know, seven years, eight years, nine years. I think that's the, um, the Eastern rat snake, if I can remember correctly. Uh, you think about the rattlesnake, the Eastern diamondback. I think it takes the male about four to five years to reach sexual maturity. So they live a long time um, if they're allowed to live a long time. Um, and, but you think about that, if it is the Eastern rat snake um, that, I'm, that I'm thinking about, you think about it reaching sexual maturity at seven, um, what if it meets the wrong human? Um, I mean, that's a lot of time that it has to be on earth before it can, it can start reproducing. Um, and those snakes, uh, the Eastern rat, um, you know, they produce, the female produces almost, you know, sometimes over 20 eggs. Think about all that food that's out there be because of that adult snake. So we need snakes to reach adulthood to, to produce those those little bites of, of nutrition for the rest of wildlife out there. Um, but sorry, I don't know that. I'm, I'm more of a bird guy, um, and that's a little bit more in-depth question, but I can find that out if, if you want me to uh, for you. All right. Um, I know you talked a lot about how to tell the difference between a non-venomous and a venomous snake. Um, so is there a difference among venomous snakes as to which are most venomous or most dangerous maybe? 
Let's see. Well, I think the coral snake is supposed to have the most venomous. I think that is a neurotoxin. I'm, this is a Brandon Ergel question, not a JK question, but I'm pretty sure that that affects the nerves uh, rather and, and it will basically make your heart stop and your lungs stop working. Whereas the pit vipers use a venom that affects your tissues and just basically dissolves, you know, that. So, um, you know, double, double check. Um, and, and again, um, you know, uh, Brandon Ergel, Parker Gibbons, um, Ryan Burris, you know, those guys on Instagram will are, are great resources um, and, and email me and I can, I can find the answer out for you there. But uh, yeah, I do know that there's two different types of venoms. You have the pit viper venom and then you have the coral snake venom. But I do want to say the coral snake, as far as I know, is more of a issue than the, than the others. Okay. Um, do, do snakes mostly hunt by sight or by smell? Gosh, you know, I was reading about the, the rat snake. They have these sensors that just kind of pick up all sorts of, you know, clues, you know, from the, from the air. That's why you'll find rat snakes in your house, which basically tells you you might have a rodent problem because they can, they can pick up. They, they might not, you know, be able to uh, smell it, but um, there, there's, there's these sensors that they have. Um, and, and, you know, animals give off these, these chemical clues and, and they can pick that up. Um, I'm sure some of it is smell. Um, they, they don't really have much hearing. They, they, they sense things by vibration. Um, so, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a copperhead that's kind of nestled in there by a fallen tree, you know, I can, I can feel that mouse coming, you know, I, I, I probably can't hear it. Um, but I also have those, those pits that, that pick up, you know, the, the heat as well. Um, but yeah, some, some uh, visually hunt, you know, you think about the diurnal ones, the ones that are um, uh, kind of active during the daytime, um, you know, a lot of the rattlesnakes are and, and they'll, they'll be, you know, the, the ambush hunters and just kind of wait for something to come by. The, uh, what is it again, the, um, the black racer will, will use its head, you know, kind of look up if, if there's, you know, a lot of grass around, it'll kind of look for, for grass moving. Um, and it, it, it uses its eyes a lot. So it just depends on, on which, which species you're, you're talking about. Okay. Um, when you were talking about water moccasins, um, there was a question about if they are also found below the fall line. They are found below the fall line. They fall are, line. they okay. are found above the fall line. So, okay. So Lake Murray, it, like maybe the southern portion of Lake Murray is b below the fall line, but as far as I've heard, and I've, I've talked to plenty of them, and Brandon Ergel, you know, his, his uncle used to, to be one of the herp herpetologists for DNR. They, DNR has never recorded a water moccasin on Lake Murray, as far as I know. Um, uh, so you think about that. Um, Lake Murray is huge, and some of it I would imagine is below the fall line. Um, not to say that one can't be seen on there, uh, but no, that's once you start getting into Columbia, like at the Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve, definitely Congaree, you know, National Park, and then lower, they're abundant. I mean, you go to slow water, you go to a floodplain, um, the ponds, lakes, you know, they, they are abundant down there. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's all the questions that I saw. If, if we haven't answered your question, please do drop it in the chat box. And uh, thanks again, Jay. Uh, and I mentioned to everyone that we will send a follow-up email. So we'll send you the recording of this uh, webinar here so you can watch it again and share it with your friends. Um, and then with that, we'll also send out our, the link to our website and um, we can send the Savannah River Ecology Lab uh, link to you as well uh, so that you can investigate their site. They have a lot of great information as well. So um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us and um, hope we will see you again soon on another event. Yeah, and just one more thing. If okay. The, the Pit Viper Venom, I, you know, I didn't want to... Um, make y'all think that it's not an issue. You need to go to the hospital immediately <laughs> if you get bit. So, you know, it, it is very, very, very serious. Um, so go to the hospital if you're bitten by a venomous species. <laughs> Good clarification there. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All, all right. right. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Jay. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of your